All right. So in a previous video, we talked about the differences between mineral and synthetic base stocks. And of course, the most common synthetic base stock of all of them is the PAO synthetic or polyalpha olefin. Now, in a, again, in a previous video, we covered the fact that polyalpha olefins are made from alpha olefins. So, you know, in this case, I'm showing five one decene molecules. I'm calling them one decene because there's a double carbon bond uh, on the first carbon carbon. And that's what gives them the name kind of like an alpha olefin. Olefin being that it's a carbon chain with a single double bond. This is kind of like the backbone of a PAO. And when you make a polyalpha olefin, it's an exercise in what they call kind of oligomerizing it. So connecting all of these molecules together with a, with a steady backbone. So what we do is, you know, in traditional methods, they put it through a boron trifluoride catalyst and then, or kind of an acid catalyst, and you, you quench the reaction with, with water or kind of like an alcohol. And eventually what you get is you get this quite regular molecule, which in this case, in, in this case we would call a one decene pentama. We call it pentama just because there's five of them. But if we let the reaction go on for longer, we could have a, you know, a hexama, for example, if we had six uh, of these one decine molecules connected together. One thing that you'll notice is, of course, that there is a, a double carbon bond on the end. So we haven't done anything to that yet, but we can sort of hydrotreat it um, and break that carbon bond to fully saturate the molecule, right? So now all of a sudden we just have single bonds everywhere. And we like that because as I explained in the previous video on polymerization, single bonds are much more stable. So they exist in the S orbital, um, double bonds, the extra electron is in the P orbital and it's much easier to grab it off. So this is in, in some respects, the most kind of stable form that you can get for a polyalpha olefin. And it's why their oxidation stability is just so good. The thing is, that picture that I showed you is not necessarily what always happens. So with boron trifluoride catalysts, we don't necessarily have a whole bunch of control over how the branch structures form. So rather than a regular backbone, you may get the connection between the different decene molecules happening at different carbons on the chain. So it could be the, you know, the first connects with the fifth, connects with the first, connects with the second, connects with the first. And so you get these kind of like irregular branch structures. Now, why is that a problem? Well, aside from the fact that the molecules are now irregular shapes, the other thing that can happen is that the double carbon bond can sometimes actually be hidden somewhere in the middle of the molecule. So why is that a problem? Well, when it comes to hydrotreating it, right, when we're trying to saturate the molecule, geometrically, if it's somewhere in the middle, it can actually be quite difficult for the hydrogen molecules to kind of attack that double bond. And often that means that some double bonds will remain in the finished product to a small degree, kind of reduces its oxidation stability a little bit, but um, it's, it's still a very good, very stable uh, molecule. One of the kind of new advances has been rather than using a boron trifluoride catalyst, they use what's called a metallocene catalyst. And what that gives us is polyalpha olefin molecules, which are much more regular, have a really regular backbone, and the double bond is always on the last carbon, so it's much easier to saturate, right? So, um, you know, a high proportion of the finished product is, is completely saturated, you know, single carbon bonds. And that gives us a few advantages. Just geometrically, for example, um, because we have a much more regular structure, we get a higher viscosity index. So we can typically get an extra kind of 10 to 20 points of viscosity index comparing a, what we call a conventional PAO with a metallocene PAO. We can also get lower traction coefficient and that comes about because the shape of the molecule is much more regular. We get better oxidation stability because like I was talking about, we have this very regular backbone with virtually no carbon-carbon double bonds, very good low temperature fluidity, and that's really kind of a byproduct of the high viscosity index and the fact that this is not going to form any wax molecules. And finally, we also get lower foaming tendency because the, the shape of these molecules is so regular and obviously carbon-hydrogen bonds, there's not a, there's not a huge uh, you know, polarity across that bond. So we end up with a very, very non-polar molecule, which um, 
tends not to take on kind of like water or hold on to air very much. Where would you see um, these new MPAO molecules? Well, they're very common, for example, in the wind industry. So the wind industry typically does oil drains. You know, historically it was around kind of like five years for a gearbox change. Sorry, a gearbox oil change. These days it's seven to ten years is is pretty typical. So you want something with very high oxidation stability that can last a long time. You've got to think that, you know, in offshore wind turbines, doing an oil change is a non-trivial exercise. It's it's very difficult to do. So you want to minimize the number of times you can do that. And so again, the C sorry, the MPA O molecule gives us, first of all, incredible oxidation stability, but also low foaming stability, which can be a problem in uh, wind turbine gearboxes. So of course, that makes it naturally a very good gear oil as well, like a standard uh, a standard enclosed gearbox. And increasingly, we are also starting to see MPO molecules come into you know very premium um, engine oils. So what does that kind of mean, I guess? Let's say, for example, with the formulation of an engine oil, there's a lot of just talk about you know, what is a synthetic and the fact that, you know, group threes are now called synthetic and have been for like, let's say the last 20 years, you know, is that really a synthetic? You know, people can contend it either way. But if you looked at, for example, a, a formulation, what MPAO enables you to do is reduce the amount of what we would call, let's say, uh, group four without losing performance properties. So as an example, you could have a base stock formulation for an engine oil which is you know group 3 or group 3 3 plus so 3 plus is usually kind of a gas to liquid so gtl technology combine that with some mpao and then you've got a co-base stock to help solvate the additives so usually that's esters or increasingly we're also seeing alkylated naphthalenes now you could compare that so this that would you know be considered by some people to not be 100 percent synthetic because you know there is some some group 3 elements in it now, compare that with what we would consider, quote-unquote, 100% synthetic, which has 100% CPAO, as well as the same co-base of ester and alkylated naphthalene. Now, these two base oil packages may have very similar performance, right? So that's why it's a little bit difficult to make conclusions about performance purely based on, you know, whether something is synthetic or, or mineral, right? So I just want to make that comparison because uh, I think, um, you know, it, it's not obvious from uh, like the MSDS or anything like that as to exactly whether the PAO in the formulation is either CPAO or MPAO. So just thought that's worth uh, clarifying. All right, um, that was a really quick one. If you've got questions or comments, please leave them down below. Otherwise, this has been Lubrication Explained.